Could there ever possibly be a law banning cell phones in every single school? Well, according to the Texas Education Agency, there might just be. Some people agree with it, and some people may not agree with it. Some people are with it, and some people are against it. Like the, like Nancy Vera, which you're about to meet. She has a very different opinion about, about making a law prohibiting cell phones in schools. But you're about to meet the commissioner who says he wants to crack down and make cell phones in schools illegal. Because of the health effects and because of all the bullying on social media. What does that mean for all the Texas Coastal Bend schools? Here's Alexis Scott. I think that's an injustice to the, to the parents of the children in the event of an emergency. That's what some parents believe when asked about the possibility of banning cell phones in schools statewide. But to have them accessible to the children while they're in the classroom in the event of an emergency is critical to their well-being as well as their safety at times. On Wednesday, TEA Commissioner of Education Mike Morath expressed to lawmakers that he doesn't want cell phones to be used by students in public schools starting next year. Cell phones are incredibly distracting to any kind of cognitive process. His comments for the ban come after discussing student outcomes on testing and exams. Senate lawmakers concerned after standardized testing scores continue to decline following the pandemic, while others worried about students' mental health. You probably don't even need that research if you have a cell phone because they are distracting. Uh, and so when cell phones can be removed from the classroom, kids learn more. We want kids to learn as much as possible in schools. With the removal of cell phones, some parents fear not being able to reach their child during an emergency. There have been more than 45 school shootings in the U.S. since the start of 2024. Nancy Vetta with the local American Federation of Teachers Union believes cell phones are not the only issue at hand. And I know that some parents have, do have some concerns regarding safety, but remember, we haven't always had cell phones. When I was in school, we didn't have cell phones, and we were fine. We should be looking at more restrictive gun laws. The cell phone with the safety situation is a symptom. It's not... Uh, the solution. Other districts in Texas like Houston ISD, Austin ISD, and Keller ISD have implemented strict cell phone policies on campuses. Locally, CCISD has also cracked down on cell phone use in the classroom. Veta adds that other school districts in the coastal bend should follow suit. Well, they should hop on the bandwagon. And I think that we are desperate as teachers to try and get those cell phones out of the way. We reached out to CCISD and they responded saying, quote, CCISD actively monitors but does not weigh in on proposed legislation. In the studio, I'm your neighborhood news reporter, Alexa Scott, Chris 6 News. And let me tell you, here's the thing. It's a kind of law that would that would work. If you were to find legislation that would approve the law. You would find you would probably find ways to improve the use of cell phones. Like, okay, what if it's an emergency? Probably put in that new law saying saying something like there we go. Say something like, okay, you can use your phone only for emergencies. But don't use your phone during instructional time or in the class or in the school. Also, the main reason why these law the cell phone laws put in place is because there's been an increase of bullying. And if you are if you're a give me a break fan, we've been talking about bullying throughout all these years. And the Adriana Kirch case would happen to be the most usage because they took footage and didn't do a damn thing, and no one stood there and helped out. All they did was just videotape their cell phone, post on social media, and say, hey, look what we got. Now, I'm not I'm I'm signing with the teachers, but I'm also signing with lawmakers because really the only time you can use your phone is in emergency purposes. Like what if I mean what if you need to get a hold of your parents? Put in the law that the only time that you can use your phone is it for emergency purposes or or if you need to reach your parents? Make make exceptions. I mean, 
if the school phone doesn't work, then the teacher has to say, give them the option to either you can either use your cell phone or you can use the school phone. But um, that probably won't work. When I was growing up, we didn't have cell phones. When I went to school, there was everyone had a cell phone, and it was a and there was rules saying you were not allowed to use your phone. If you're allowed, if you were, you use your phone without permission, it get taken away. And if you use it, and you get, what do you have back? Probably sometimes at the end of the class, or at the end of the day. Bring it again. You got to pay fifteen dollars to get it back. It used to be just the students. Now it's the parents. We got to pay for them. But this is the bottom line here. Cell phones are a distraction in the educational process. They are not to be seen. Coming up, some examples of people, students that were caught using phones in class. Even one that was very disrespectful in the cafeteria. Still ahead, house arrests. And later on, the power of persuasion. Please stay with us. Look, everybody may have their their own opinion about what would I mean without a cell phone in school. I mean, it'd be like the parent, kids would be like, well, it's just the worst thing ever. School's boring as it is, and you need a way to interact, interact with people. That may be true. Cell phones should be allowed in case of emergencies, accessories at the calculator, or in use for educational games. It's called policy for a reason. Schools create policies like this to prevent distraction to the educational process. Like, you know, you're teaching a class and all of a sudden someone points and says, Oh my god, more is coming on. That's why cell phones are prohibited because it's a distraction to the educational process. I mean, what if it, but unless it's an emergency, like, you know, you need to contact, call home or you need to uh, contact your neighbor. If your school's policy says it's only used for emergencies, and take a look at your school policy. Ten, year, ten years ago, here in Florida Bluff, they implemented something called a BYOD, which is a Bring Your Own Device Policy. Basically, it meant that you were allowed to bring your electronic devices in, and you can use it. You would you were to use that you can use them during before school, during class periods, during lunch, after school, or the teacher gives you permission. But because of the data, they decided to change up the policy to where you're not allowed to use your phone unless the teacher gives you, or teacher or administrator gives you permission to use your phone. And the teachers do have the right to confiscate your phone. So let's take a look at some clips from the principal's office explaining this policy, especially then. First, a phone home. One student was caught using a cell phone and ended up him calling his mother. I just received a write-up about a junior student that was caught in the hallway with a cell phone. I called him down and we'll, we'll go over the regulations. And without a cell phone in school, it's just like the worst thing ever. There's nothing else to do. School's boring as it is. And you need, you need a way to interact with other people. <laughs> what is the rule here at Manalpa High School as far as cell phones are concerned? No cell phones. Uh, well, well, our conversation's over. Enjoy your two detentions. I'm not happy with that. She's wearing, she's not even my teacher. She, I'm just no, 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 no. You're, you're missing the point, okay? You're missing the point. The point is this. You're the one who made the decision to do the incorrect thing. You have two central office detentions for having that cell phone out. I don't think it's fair. Here, call mom on the phone right now and tell her you got these two central office detentions. So I'm, my mom would be too mad. I think she'd be more mad at Mr. Tate for taking it too seriously. Mom, uh, I got in trouble today in school. My phone got taken away, and I got two central office detentions. Ryan, I can't believe this. You really should know that it's really rude. Yeah, but I, I feel like it wasn't my fault, though. She just took my phone away. She signed my teacher. I, I am really disappointed. It wasn't even my fault. What's going on today? It's your cell phone. Yeah. You're not supposed to have that cell phone in school. Uh, That's it. All right. I know you don't have a cell phone. Go on. 
just me. I get a pack? Thank you. It's very mean. No, your mom's right. It's written in the handbook. She signed for it. Mom said it better than I could have said it. Goodbye, Ryan. Have a good day. I'm very mad that she took Mr. Pig's side. I, when I get home, I'm going to give a piece of my mind about that. His mom backed us up 100%. He, he shouldn't have it. Mom said she's going to take it for a month. Doesn't I mean yes. Agreed. Things you have to understand here is this. When you create self, when you when you create, when you create costs like this, people are questioning the like, okay, what do you do? So uh, there's another one. So while we're scrolling through here, oh, there it is. Here's one. All schools have cell phone policies, no matter what. And look, if it's an emergency, you need to talk to your teacher beforehand. Or talk to the administrator beforehand and say, hey, hey I need to contact my mom, it's an emergency. And just explain the emergency. Like, well, this, this, that, and the third. And he or she, can, and he or she gives you permission and says, yes, that's, that's okay, that's okay. She says, no, wait, then you need to wait. So, just because, listen, just because, just because that, you know, you're, like, this, this, that, and the third happens, it does, just because, like, it's not an emergency or whatever, there we go, just because it's not an emergency or whatever, it doesn't give you the right to say, hey, you know, I don't care about the rules, I want to use, I'm going to use myself whenever I want. For one girl, she was like, I was sending a text message and the teacher came by, so disrespectful. Cell phones are not cell phones are not allowed in this building once school starts. They're not to be seen. I just got sent to Mr. Tay's office because I was texting at lunch and a teacher tried to take my phone, but I wouldn't give it to her. You gave the teacher in the uh, lunchroom a hard time? Yeah. Why? Who the heck do you think you are? Okay. I was talking to my friends in lunch, and I sent one text message to my mom, who was calling me. You could check. And the teacher came running over. She started yelling in my face. She's like, that's so disrespectful. I was like, what am I doing to you? Like, I'm in my lunch. Like, this is my period off, and you're really going to yell at me? I don't even know this teacher. She just came at me out of nowhere and started yelling at me over my phone, which is so stupid and ridiculous. So the bottom line is, this is the fight. Teacher asked you for the phone, you give her the phone. But if I gave her my phone, I wouldn't have had a phone, and I need it for after school. I have work. Bottom line is, you weren't doing what you were supposed to do. Who's driving the bus in this situation? What bus are you talking about? There's no actual bus, it's just the same. The person who created the situation. Oh. Who created this whole situation? Mm, the teacher. That teacher in there was just doing what she's supposed to she's do. She's annoying. I really don't think there's anything wrong with texting and lunch. I'm not in a class. I'm not missing lessons. So, like, caught me some slack. Unfortunately, I have to take the phone you know, to give to your mother. I have plans tonight. I can't have my phone. I don't know if my mom can pick it up. I need to go out with my phone. Kate. Are you serious? Yeah, here we go. I Kate. need to make plans with my phone. Kate, unfortunately, you put us both in the middle of this silly situation. No, the teacher did. No, the teacher did her job. My cell phone is like... I can't function without it. I need it on me at all times. Thank you. All right, you suspend it tomorrow. Are you serious? Yes. For texting in lunch? No, for having the cell phone out and not giving it to the teacher. If she had just given the phone to the teacher when it was requested, she would have gotten two central office attentions. Instead, by not giving it to her and being disrespectful, she got suspended for a day. Good luck, Kate. Mr. Jake said, I'm in charge of the situation and I'm gonna be driving the bus. So I'm gonna drive this bus all around town tomorrow and not drive to school. And it's gonna be great. Okay, that was very disrespectful. If she had just gave her the phone, she would have gotten the tension. But no, she had to be like, this is my period off, you gotta yell at me? Bottom line, that was very unacceptable behavior. Very acceptable. Still ahead tonight. The power of persuasion. Some people just seem to have it. How do, you, how do you know if you have persuasion or not? The four contenders took a dateline test. Later on, house arrest. When we return, 
more about these students who don't understand why cell phones are banned in these schools. Please stay with us. Could you ever imagine, like, you know, you bring a cell phone to school, and yet the school says you're not supposed to bring it. But then you realize, my phone got stolen. I'm going to go march to the principal, and he tells you, what do you want me to do about it? Huh? Why am I detected all of a sudden? <laughs> well, in this case right here, it it was really the icing on the cake. Sans cell phone. Take a look. Has a history of anger. Jaleesa has a history of anger problems. Come in. The more she talks, the more angry she gets. And she had an electronic device stolen. What's your deal? D, somebody stole my phone. So what do you want me to do about it? One of the students got my phone. I left it on the desk. I went in the closet. They put my pocketbook in there. I come back. My phone is off the desk. <sighs> What I was doing with Jaleesa was trying to give her every impression that I had no sympathy for her whatsoever. In, in reality, I felt bad for her, uh, but I wouldn't go show her that for a second. Were you supposed to bring your phone to school? No. <laughs> uh huh. What do you want me to do about it? Find out who took my phone. So, so why am I a detective all of a sudden? It should be well. It's not your responsibility, but ah, uh, whose responsibility is? It was my responsibility because that was oh, my. Are you, you going to start yelling at me? No, but I'm mad because. Uh, okay, my phone. Come on, I don't feel like you're being yelled at. Okay. So it's so there's nothing nobody can do about my phone. Come on, Jaleesa, you messed up. Why don't you just say you messed up? It's like, oh, I made a mistake. Who can I blame? Why don't you just point your finger at yourself and and just go? You know what? I screwed up period, and just be done with it and stop being a big baby, whining at everybody, take the responsibility. Take the responsibility. D, I am taking the responsibility. Then why are you coming here? Because you're the principal. Okay, that's it. I'm sorry. I'm not taking your responsibility. You're a grown woman. Don't bring your cell phone to school. Don't lose it. Boom. That's it. Sorry. You made a mistake. You got, you, you, I'm sorry. Go get a job. Make the money. Go get the phone. But, D, I wouldn't have got up. Well, you wouldn't take your phone with you. Why are you always blame somebody else? When I got up, get signed from it. Did, did, I say, did I say don't take the phone with you? D, you keep shooting no, on me. You know what the deal is? No, nothing. Zero. Zero. You got the message here on this one? I wrapped it up with Jaleesa by saying, sorry, no takers here. You are totally responsible. Continue to grow up. I know I'm not supposed to bring cell phones to school, but I was trying to be sneaky and get away with it. And now somebody took my phone. So I got to face the fact that I got to buy another phone. It's just all about responsibilities. They can take your phone and put it up. That's how it is. Well, we will look more into this, but really, we got some other matters to take care of. Let's move on. Okay. House arrest. Do you go to the? You go to court because of something the judge says. I hereby sentence you to six months house arrest. And what is house arrest? Well, house arrest. Meaning, you need to stay in the home where you live in. You cannot leave the perimeter. You are put on an ankle monitor. An ankle monitor is a little electronic device, which you can find everywhere. Which you can, which you, which you probably have in your ankle right now. So if you're under house arrest, this is this, this is the issue for you. If you're if you're placed under house arrest, you cannot leave the premises unless it's for work. Whoops, I must have, uh... Oh, there we go. So as I was saying here, house arrest is basically you have an ankle monitor in your system, and then if you leave the premises, you can get in trouble. And it can happen. So...
It really can't happen. But what we're about to show you is sometimes house arrest doesn't work. And why is that? Well, because probably those anchor monitors. That we're going to show you. We're going to show you why these anchor monitors probably don't work. And we're going to. And we're going to. We're going to introduce you to someone by the name of Steve Martinez. Because of electronic supervisors or ESS. And once after you see this report, you'll probably understand more about house arrest. So really, if you're placed under house arrest, it's just ankle monitor. You can't leave the premises. So uh before we get into that report, let's look more let's look more in depth into house arrest. This is one of the first issues we this is one of the issues we have not talked about in this broadcast and it's not it's not a movie about being under house arrest. It's a court order stands that confirms the person in their home as an alternative to jail time. Different stages of the criminal justice system, which is while rating trial or sentencing. Partial house arrest, tracking only house arrest. I mean, it's all these ankle monitors. The rules are to this. I mean, it's not like this movie. I mean, it's ankle monitors. You just place an ankle on your. The monitor's placed on your ankle, and you leave the house, it goes. Beep, 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 and you're tired of hearing that sound, and so. You try to take it off because you want you don't want to be under house arrest, and it beeps. So that's how it is. So what really happened with Steve, with Steve Martinez after he was placed in house arrest? Did his ankle monitor broke, or did he actually take it off? Here's Brian Ross. of October 5th, 1991, there was only one place where Steve Martinez was supposed to be, and that one place was definitely not on this block of Alberta Street in the Los Angeles suburb of Carson. Steve Martinez was supposed to be at home. Despite a conviction for shooting off a gun, the judge didn't send Martinez to jail, but instead put him on house arrest. And under a new cost-saving program, the responsibility for making sure Martinez stayed at home belonged to a private company called Electronic Supervision Services, ESS. Hello. Hi, I need you to verify for me, please. ESS has become a kind of electronic jailer for hundreds of convicted Los Angeles criminals. Let's take a look at your strap. Its business is to monitor the whereabouts of people who, instead of going to jail, wear a special ankle bracelet. This is an electronic transmitter, and it's an anklet that is worn 24 hours a day, seven days a week, at all times by the defendant while he's on house arrest. Bill Smith is the president of ESS, one of a number of private companies around the country, now in the business of keeping electronic track of some 40,000 people 24 hours a day, people who would otherwise be behind bars. Well, everything's plugged in, right? The green light's on, on the unit? Smith says the employees at his computer control room know instantly okay. if someone wearing an ankle bracelet has left the house. You sleep well at night knowing this system is in place? Very well, and uh, feel very good, and I think most of the staff here, most of the people that understand house arrest and how it works, uh, believe that it's a, it's a great program. Nikki Martinez thought it was a great program, too. Nikki was the wife of Steve Martinez, the man supposedly being monitored 24 hours a day by ESS. Nikki's family says Steve Martinez was a dangerous man. Was your daughter afraid of Steve? Deadly afraid of him. Why? Well, because of the threats he had made to her. Nikki's family says she felt a great sense of security once her husband was on the ankle bracelet. She had a lot of safety because she realized he was in house arrest. Enough so to finally leave him 
confident he wouldn't be able to come after her and hurt her. And uh, she says, you know, you don't have to worry. He can't leave the house. He has to stay at the house because he has the ankle bracelet. So just after midnight, on that quiet night when Nikki Martinez pulled on to Alberta Street to drop off her best friend, April Wood, the last person she expected to see was her husband, Steve. She said, oh my God, April, I see Steve's truck on the corner. I said, are you sure? And she said, yes, I'm sure. I was like, he's supposed to be home. You know, he's, he's on the house arrest system. He's home safe and sound, you know, away from there. April Wood was in the car that night with Nikki as Steve Martinez appeared out of nowhere. He walks up to the car, grabbed the gun, he put it to her head. He told her, you effed up. She was trying to get away from him, trying to push the gun away from him, but she couldn't, and she just stopped pushing. Then when I seen her hands drop, that was probably on the second shot, and then that's when I grabbed her hand, and then she died. How many times was she shot in the head? Four. Four times, I... Two days later, when Steve Martinez surrendered to police, there was no ankle bracelet on his ankle. Martinez had simply cut it off and walked out the front door. But at ESS, despite all the computers and the assurances, no one knew that for some 48 hours, long after he had murdered his unsuspecting wife. She had a false sense of security with that bracelet. And up until the last minute, she felt secure. She thought that was going to help her, and it didn't. This equipment's not going to prevent somebody from going out and committing murder. She felt she was safe from him because he was wearing that bracelet. Right. That essentially you, someone in authority, was watching out. That if he moved away from the house, the police would be called. Well, that may be what she said. I cannot believe that anyone would expect there weren't bars on her windows. There was this transmitter around his ankle. If she thinks that this transmitter being around his ankle is in any way going to protect her, her, then she's misled. She's dead. Well, she is dead. That's unfortunate. Now, how could this be? The defendant was currently under house arrest. How that could be became clear only last month during the murder trial of Steve Martinez. Is this a strap? This is a similar strap. It turns out the ankle bracelet Martinez was wearing was a cheaper, outdated model that once cut off, continued to transmit as if Martinez were still at home. ESS bought the bracelet from a company in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Good morning, Correction Services. The company chairman, Ron Martini, says it was no secret that that particular bracelet, known as the Hawk, had many limitations. If the person wearing this cut it off, and put it down next to the transmitter. Mm -hmm. As far as anybody knew, that person was still at home. That's correct. Uh -huh. He could be on the street. That's right. Martini says any problems were not the fault of the equipment, really, but of Phil Smith and ESS, with whom he's had financial disputes. They were, they were running a very sloppy program, and uh, I was quite lucky to terminate my relationship with ESS. And the outdated ankle bracelets weren't the only problem at ESS. The company was supposed to have a backup safety system of random phone calls made to people under house arrest. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. But according to ESS's own phone logs, on October 5th, the day Martinez escaped, no calls were made to his home. All Phil Smith says is that neither the judge who sentenced Martinez to house arrest nor his own employees thought Martinez was dangerous. We did exactly what our job was in the program. Well. And the program... It, it's, it's working wonderfully. It's working very, very well. How do you say that, given the death of Nicky Martinez? How do you say that? How can you say that that was our fault or could have been predicted? There was nothing in this particular defendant's history that would lead you to believe that he was going to commit this crime. Nothing. That I'm aware of in his history. But Martinez's own lawyer, Henry Salcido, says that's just not true. Something much stronger than what was done should have been done. Salcido showed us an evaluation form done by the ESS employee handling Martinez, describing Martinez as having severe emotional problems just three days before the murder. Should he have been taken off the program at that point? On reflection? Yes. Certainly. 
We have, you know, thousands and thousands of cases. How many cases have you had where somebody's murdered someone? Where someone's murdered someone? Uh, not very many. How many? Well, four or five, maybe. You've had four or five people right. under your supervision who have murdered someone? That's correct. And you think this is a good program? Uh, it's an excellent program. It's an excellent program. And the Los Angeles court system, after its own review of ESS, seems to agree. Despite the Martinez case and the four or five other murders, ESS continues to handle hundreds of people on house arrest. But that's in sharp contrast to what's happened in some places with ankle bracelet problems. In New Jersey, the state ended its ankle bracelet program after a series of crimes and a murder. Okay. Next. And in Chicago, the Cook County Sheriff threw out the private company running the program and put in his own deputies after a series of ankle bracelet murders. Next. They figured out a way to beat the system, and many of them were very good. Sheriff Michael Sheehan says that a private company in it just to make a profit has no business doing important police work. Uh, in many cases, we, we had to wait three and four hours before we even knew there was a violation. Sheehan says there are still problems, but at least now, trained sheriff's officers handle the computers. We're not going to have any more problems, right, Kevin? 3,400, 3,455 drugs. And there are surprise spot checks to make sure at-home prisoners stay at home. Why don't you link up here a minute, Craig? Let's take a look at that. I would never want to run a program ever again where I had to rely on a third party. Absolutely, that's not the way to go. I would never do that. I wouldn't accept that I'd put everybody back in jail. What's the risk? They can go out and commit more crime, in some cases commit murder. And our investigation found at least a dozen murders across the country, in addition to the four or five ESS told us about, all committed by people supposedly safe at home under electronic house arrest including one murder in this building involving the exact same kind of ankle bracelet worn by Steve Martinez in Los Angeles. I can hear a scream out my name for help. And I just couldn't be there. The victim was the daughter of Nancy Kalinowski, 11-year-old Holly, a babysitter in Lake County, Illinois, found murdered, raped, and stabbed 27 times. The man charged with the crime, Juan Rivera, now awaiting trial, was supposed to be under house arrest wearing his ankle bracelet. But authorities say Rivera boasted in jail of how he regularly left his home, simply slipping off his hawk ankle bracelet whenever he wanted to go out. And as with Steve Martinez, no one knew about it until it was too late. And there's still a, a market for some of this early equipment. Incredible. The supplier, Ron Martini, told us that even though he now sells a new tamper-proof model, there may be as many as 5,000 of the outdated ankle bracelets still in use around the country, including in Lake County, where just months before the murder of 11-year-old Holly, county officials decided against buying a new tamper-proof system, saying they couldn't afford the estimated $57,000 cost. Why don't you, at your own cost, recall these? Couldn't afford to do it. You couldn't. Couldn't afford to, this company could not afford to do it. Would it put you out of business? It could. It could, but most of all... What would be wrong with you being out of business and that little girl still being alive? It would be probably better for the girl being alive. Why didn't you do it? Because I was never faced with that situation. And your interview is zeroing in on an area that, yes, it's a problem, but you apparently are going to zero in only on this area and isn't it worth looking at it certainly is and the whole program should be looked at but in lake county illinois any lessons from what happened to 11 year old holly seem to have been lost county officials would not talk with dateline but they do confirm the county continues to use the outdated ankle bracelets why don't they just give me a criminal and stab an ankle bracelet, a gun, and say, here, go kill somebody. Because it's the same thing. And in Los Angeles, the lessons of what happened here on Alfreda Street seem to have been lost on Phil Smith, who, despite the murder of Mickey Martinez, says his company hasn't changed a thing. Have we changed the program? No, there would be no reason to change the program. We did, we did exactly what we're supposed to do. You, you do nothing differently now. You can't. You can't do anything differently. 
I think people might be surprised to learn you haven't done a thing to change the program. Well, there was no, there's no, what, what, what would you suggest that we do to change the program? What, close, close the doors or, or, or not offer this, this service? We, that we didn't, we did exactly what we were supposed to do. He can go to hell. It's, I mean, what, he, he's here, she's not. If the people can't feel safe, why, why are they going to have it? We want people to know that that bracelet is nothing. It doesn't mean anything. It's not going to give you any safety measure. It's, it's not a security that you think it is. And that's one thing that even Phil Smith has to agree is true. The public should not feel that this is going to prevent a person from going out and committing a crime. So there could be another Martinez case? Of course there could be another Martinez case. Well, it's up to individual judges to decide who's eligible for house arrest. As for the bracelets themselves, there are no uniform national standards, which may explain why those 5,000 outdated ankle bracelets are still in use tonight. If they're still in use, then you see, there's an issue here. You know, if you're eligible for house arrest, the ankle, that's the ankle liner. If that's on you, you need to be under, able to understand, say to yourself, hey, I'm under house arrest. If I leave the house, it's going to go beep, 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 beep. And then they're going to, then they're going to know. The police want you to know, and yet you violated your house arrest order. So if you're under house arrest, you can't leave your house. You stay put. If you're at work, then they may make an exception for you going to work. But that, but that monitor needs to be on you at all times. No ifs and buts or excuses. Coming up, sweatshops. Hidden cameras looking to kids, working at sweatshops. So the clothing you wear is probably made overseas. Please stay with us. Well, a short time ago, a couple of days ago, we did a story all about Kathy Lee Gifford on how on how she was shocked to learn her name was on was on clothing bands, and how she was very upset that people called her out, saying that she doesn't care about children and she exploits children. She says that she does not exploit children; she loves children. She has a child of her own. And when she talked to Cynthia McFadden, she let she set the record straight. We also, we, and during that time, we also looked in the sweatshops, underage kids. In different countries, looking, working, working on, working on T-shirts and button-down shirts. Prior to, before that, we also looked into "Made in the USA," meaning different countries would put, put on the label "Made in the USA." Tonight, we're looking more in depth into stuff like this. Are those factories following more labor laws? And if so, and if not. What does need to change? Here's Chris Hansen. Americans love a deal. And these days, thanks to the fast-paced global marketplace and big discount retailers, products are better and cheaper than ever. But what price do people in faraway places pay so Americans can get their bargains in stores like Walmart? Now, these are all pants. These women's sports pants, for instance, sold under a brand owned by Sara Lee. Like most clothes, they're foreign made. It's a Bangladesh. Bangladesh? Yeah, do you know where that is? I have no idea. And it's no secret to these shoppers why the $12.84 pants are made overseas. Cheaper labor. Right. Consumers have come to expect those low prices to make ends meet. I got a mortgage to pay, the car payment, and everything. Tonight, we'll investigate what's behind the bargains American shoppers count on. With our hidden cameras, we'll find out who sews those pants and under what conditions. We'll see how problematic it can be for American companies to monitor working conditions in foreign factories they don't control, where factory owners are under pressure to keep costs down while still treating workers fairly. They are very tough with the management. Here's the lab bars. But how much do his employees really love their working conditions? I can't even go to the bathroom without my supervisor's permission. We'll invite two of the shoppers we met at Walmart, Vilma Matera and her sister-in-law, Peggy Rockiola, to take a look at the results of our investigation. Vilma, what do you suppose life is like for the folks in Bangladesh who make these 
Mm-hmm. I really, really don't have any idea. When I'm shopping, I don't have my mind fixed on the lives of the people that made the clothes. Bangladesh, where those pants are made, is halfway around the globe. To America, it can seem a universe away. It's a mostly Muslim country next door to India, where a handful of rich are surrounded by masses of poor. It's the most densely populated country in the world, a land overwhelmed by seasonal floods and frequent disasters. Life here can be hard. Jobs are hard to come by, and the few there are pay very little. The average income is only $400 a year. The biggest industry by far is the garment business, which employs nearly 2 million people and exports more than $5 billion of clothing a year, much of it to American companies like Kmart and Gap. And the top customer here? Walmart. Twelve years ago, American companies were embarrassed by a Dateline expose, small children in Bangladesh making clothing for the U.S. market. They vowed to stop that practice. And in fact, human rights groups and American companies agree that child labor is no longer a major problem in Bangladesh's garment factories. And Dateline found no sign of it either. Kevin Burke heads the American Apparel and Footwear Association. For the amount of time that we're talking about here, we've made tremendous strides. But keeping children out of factories is only part of it. American companies now demand that foreign manufacturers follow strict rules, codes of conduct, and they even send in inspectors to check up on them. Making sure there's proper ventilation, heating, uh, that people are getting breaks, that they're, ma- that they're paying the workers the minimum wage based upon uh, the laws of that country. But are American companies getting the true picture? Are all the rules really being followed? To find out, we create a fictitious company called Hanson Fashions, complete with our own website. And with our hidden cameras, we present ourselves as executives looking to do business in Bangladesh. We asked Charles Kernigan to act as a clothing buyer for our company. He's a labor activist who's done battle for years with American retailers over working conditions in foreign factories. In conjunction with Kernigan, we call many factories, among them companies being monitored by local labor groups for poor working conditions. This is the factory here. Our first stop, a large factory that's done business with several American giants. We brought along a denim shirt. For us, this is a pretty good shirt. And asked if they could make one like it for our company, Hanson Fashions, to sell in the U.S. We explained that like other American companies, we're not just looking for the lowest price. Of course, like you, a certain reputation in the United States, which we have to guard. We want assurances that their working conditions are humane that they comply with those codes of conduct required by U.S. companies. We're certain that the factory is in 100% compliance and, you know, 100%. To try to prove their point, they take us on a factory tour. We see American companies' codes of conduct posted in a public area. And they say they go further. They have a medical office for employees. So on the day of our visit, the doctor isn't in. On the factory floor, they assure us they don't overwork their employees. So how many hours normally do they work? Eight hours. So it's eight to five. Really? One hour less break. Mm-hmm. Plus two hours over time up to seven o'clock. That's ten hours a day, based on a six-day work week. A total of 60 hours, the maximum allowed under Bangladesh law and most corporate codes of conduct. At a second factory where we take our denim shirt, Reinforced collar, fully vented sleeves, unbreakable. We hear the same kinds of promises about working conditions. And this executive boasts about his relationship with his employees. They're very much happy with the management. If they love us. Oh, this is Kira? Yeah, yeah. For America. Most of what they make, they say, is headed for the U.S. This is Kmart. (laughs) They make NFL sportswear. At the second factory, we ask what kind of a deal they can give us on our denim shirt. Uh, five, 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 five. Not, no, no, no. 
$5.50 per shirt. That's less than half what it would cost to make at a factory in the U.S. We tell him we're interested, and the next day we return, saying we're ready to close the deal, but only if he'll agree to sign a basic code of conduct. This is our compliance code. The terms include what many American retailers ask for, to obey local laws by guaranteeing one day off per week and a maximum of two hours overtime per day. I think it's okay. And he signed. We also want to make sure he's paying his employees at least the minimum wage. Bangladesh is extremely low, less than 20 cents an hour. So we're stunned when he says he pays 10 times that amount. Two dollars per hour. Per hour. Two dollars. Here. Two dollars an hour. It sounds much too high to be true. We wonder if he understands us. So we ask again. So you pay your workers two dollars U.S. two dollars U.S. an hour here? He doesn't know that over a two-week period we've been monitoring his factory with our hidden cameras. We've been documenting the real working conditions and speaking with some of his workers. With the money I earn, we barely survive. Barely surviving. Dis with the money I earn, we barely survive. Barely surviving. But how is that so? When we come back, more on this investigation. Chris Hansen goes undercover looking more into child labor violations like this. Is it child labor violation or, or is it something else? Stay with us. Returning to our story, as we've seen, you've seen what happened with child labor. Working long hours, minimum wage, $2 an hour under over 20 cents in Bangladesh. You've also seen the fictitious website called Hanson Fashion. But is it still being practiced? You're about to see more hand camera footage of more law violations, like working late hours. And you'll hear what two shoppers had to say as they look at that hidden camera tape. Once again, here's Chris Hanson. When he thought we were buyers for a company called Hanson Fashions, this factory director in Bangladesh insisted he treated his workers fairly. So you pay your workers two dollars U.S. two dollars U.S. an hour here. He also promised us his workers had at least one day off a week, Friday, the Muslim holy day, as required by local law. I think it's okay. He even agreed to sign a code of conduct a promise his employees would not work more than 60 hours a week. But it turns out not all of his promises were true, something we discover only with our hidden cameras and from candid conversations with some of his employees who were introduced to us by a local labor group, like this young woman. My name is Rasuma. I work for the Wells Garment Company. Uh, I am a sewing machine operator. Masuma says she's around 21. She doesn't seem to know for sure. Like most women here, she's barely literate. I went to school for first grade. Then, my parents couldn't afford to keep me in school any longer. On a typical day, she heads to the factory by 7.30. She has to be at her sewing machine by 8 o'clock sharp. If I'm one minute late, my supervisor scolds me and gives me a hard time. Remember those striped pants that sell for $12.84 at Walmart? It's Masuma who sews the stripes on them, and she sews them hour after hour with only a few breaks, sitting on a stool that has no back. I have to sit in front of the machine the whole time. I can't move. I can't even go to the bathroom without my supervisor's permission. After sitting for so long, I feel pain throughout my body. Conditions like these might seem unacceptable to Americans, but they're common in a poor place like Bangladesh. Extreme heat, for instance. Factories like Masuma's aren't air-conditioned. And even in a well-ventilated factory, we found temperatures can easily exceed 90 degrees. Masuma says she has a quota, 80 stripes an hour. That means more than one stripe every minute, and they have to be perfectly straight. If she doesn't meet the quota, she says she has to work extra for no pay. The factory director said his employees work a maximum of 10 hours a day and get out by 7 p.m. But Masuma told us her typical day ends later than that. Usually I work till at least 8 p.m. 
but often they would keep us and make us work till 10 p.m. And she says she frequently has to work Fridays, the Muslim holy day, which by law is supposed to be a day off. On average, she says she works more than 70 hours a week, at least 10 hours more than allowed by the local law. It's not hard to confirm that many factories run over that limit. You'll see the work around up here. Just take a drive at 10 p.m., says labor activist Charles Kernigan. It's 10 o'clock at night. They're still going. We see lights on. People still at work at factory after factory, including this one, which happens to be that first factory we visited as Hanson Fashion. Remember, a few days earlier they told us they don't overwork their employees. So how many hours normally do they work? Eight hours? Plus two hours over time, up to seven o'clock. Yet on the night we checked, quitting time is three hours later than that, 10 p.m. And the workers are being frisked to make sure they haven't stolen anything. If you think 10 p.m. is late, try 1 a.m. When this video was taken with our hidden cameras inside a factory that makes clothes that end up at Kmart and Walmart. These workers who are racing to meet a production deadline have been on the job since 8 o'clock the previous morning. And they won't get out until 3 a.m. So they'll be working 18 to 19 hours straight and they have to be at work the next day at 8 o'clock in the morning. We showed what we found to our bargain hunter. 18 and they have to be straight. back at work. Exactly. Eight. This man, introduced to us by a local labor group, asked us to protect his identity. He's a supervisor at a large factory in Bangladesh. He says that when American companies send inspectors to check on the codes of conduct, they don't always get the real story because some workers are coached to lie. You're supposed to say that this factory is closed on Fridays and that no one works here at night. If anyone tells the buyer otherwise, then the company will fire them. He says they go so far as to make up phony records, time cards for instance like these, showing a normal 10-hour work shift ending at 7 p.m., even though the workers themselves say they were on the job until much later, something he says they don't want American companies to know. They hide the extra overtime from the buyer. The reason is that they want to show the buyer that they treat the workers well and follow all the rules. And when they do work those extra hours of overtime, sometimes into the middle of the night, many workers complain that they're shortchanged, not paid all the additional wages the local law requires. Some are so exhausted during the day, they grab sleep whenever and wherever they can, even at their machines. And some say they face verbal and physical abuse on the job. This man says when he took too long to return from a break, his boss struck him with a shoe. But the big question, how much are workers really paid? It turns out starting wages can be as low as 10 cents an hour. That was something the manager at that first factory acknowledged. Uh, about 10, 11, 10 cents. And like a senior operator, about $2. But remember, Masuma's boss told us he pays his employees $2 an hour. If that was the case, Masuma would be taking home an astonishing $140 a week. What does she say? If I earned that kind of money, do you think I would be dressed like this? I would have much nicer clothing. Masuma says she's paid more like 17 cents an hour, a perfectly legal wage here, and more than many Bangladeshis earn. So for a 70-hour week, she brings home about $12. What kind of life does that buy? Masuma showed us her home, two small rooms where she says she lives with her mother, two-year-old daughter, and a couple of other garment workers. There's no table. She makes and eats breakfast on the floor. Only water comes from a pump they share with neighbors. After paying the rent, Masuma says she cannot afford very much. Her typical diet is rice and lentils. Fish and meat are too expensive, she says. One chicken costs more than she's paid for an entire day. Sometimes we go without food. And sometimes when the heavy rains come and there are floods, they have to go without a home. As bad as she has it, Masuma is better off than many of the people she works with. 
This bamboo walkway leads to a slum built on stilts where many garment workers live over a swamp and where they sleep on the floor. More than 30 families share this one cooking area. What do our bargain hunters make of it all? That's slave labor. Slave labor? Absolutely slave labor. Slave labor perhaps by American standards, but in Bangladesh, where 40% of the population lives in abject poverty, Masuma's earnings are higher than average. Regardless, Masuma says, she's too tired to dream of a better life, or even think about something as simple as where the clothes she makes end up. I don't know anything about Mary, except that it's a faraway place. But that's about to change. Masuma is about to make a journey into a new world where she'll follow the fruits of her labor to their destination and find out just how much Americans pay for the clothes she makes. This is 780 times. Yeah, the eight pent of them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what is this new visitor going to see when she goes to Walmart? Chris Hans has a conclusion excuse me, to our story when we come back. Stay with us. And now the conclusion to our story. You've seen what happens when child labor is, laws are violated. You've also met a woman who says she, she has to live, she makes 12 cents an hour at that factory we saw. Now she wants to travel to the U.S. to Walmart where her clothing is is sold by the consumers. Would they would those consumers that we saw in our video that saw the investigation be able to pay a lot a few more cents? Once again, Chris Hansen. In Bangladesh, this young woman, Masuma, works seventy hours a week for seventeen cents an hour, selling stripes on pants sold at Walmart. She says she's barely surviving. But a spokesman for the garment industry in Bangladesh says that as poor as Masuma and her co-workers are, it could be a lot worse. If they avoid droplets, then what standard they are maintaining? What standard they can maintain? There is no standard at all. Look for Rahman, who has a couple of factories of his own, says that the industry is doing what it can, setting up health clinics. And a model private school for workers' kids. But he says it's hard to do more when American companies are constantly pressing for lower prices. We are trying to reduce price, at least to keep the factory running. He admits factory workers sometimes do have to put in extra long hours. For instance, when deadlines are looming and fabric deliveries are late. They have little choice, he says. Meet the deadline, or American companies could take their business elsewhere. Simply that would be a disaster. When we were undercover at Hanson Fashions, this executive told us that he wanted to pay higher wages, but he claimed Walmart wouldn't agree to pay even a penny more per garment. Me, in fact, I told Walmart, give me one cent more a piece. One cent. I will use that money for these poor people. He says, no, give us two cents less. What would a worker like Masuma think if she could see just how much the clothes she stitches sell for? 19 companies signed the pledge. We got a chance to find out. After she was interviewed for this report, Charles Kernigan's organization decided on its own to bring Masuma to the United States as part of the group's campaign to improve working conditions overseas. When she arrived, we asked Masuma, along with a translator, to come with us to a Walmart in Connecticut. She's amazed at the size of the shop from the outside, so she's like really excited about going in. Inside, Masuma can't believe there's so much for sale all under one roof. This one, no? It, it don't like that. And then, in the women's clothing section, a familiar sight. Clothes she made. It happened need a person. She has done this. So you have actually sewn these stripes on, these pants, in Bangladesh. Yes. She's curious about everything, more than anything. She wants to know the price. $12.84, so... She's shocked because the price of the pants is equivalent to one week's pay for her. She's like, what can I think? What can I say? This is like beyond anything I'd ever thought of. She says the price of the pants leaves her feeling taken advantage of. If she was paid 25 cents an hour instead of 17 
50% raise, she says she could lead what she considers a decent life. So this Fiona taco would mean I could have a diet that consisted of more than lentils and rice. I could buy a few good vegetables, a good fish. I could buy more food products for my daughter. We wondered what a shopper at this store would think about Masuma's situation. So we stopped one and introduced her to Masuma. Would you like, would you like to meet Masuma? How are you? Would she be willing to pay more for her clothes so Masuma could earn more? What do you say to a woman like Masuma? Who... I wouldn't sell for it. Makes pennies an hour. I wouldn't sell for it, but again, what's the flip side of the coin? You either take, it's like, I'm, I have to take what I get or my, I don't eat. But here's the deal. This stuff is very inexpensive here because she only gets paid pennies an hour. I know. But like I said, I mean, I'm doing the reality part of the deal here. It is what it is. It is what it is. You know, I can't tell her don't put the stripes on a pants. While she feels for Masuma, she says her budget is tight. She cleans houses for a living. What you're seeing is the debate over globalization in its simplest form. So if this was 25 cents more, though, would you would you, you notice would you they pay? had some for $18, and I passed the $18 one again. So this, this means a lot to you that you can buy these products for this price. Sure. You're counting your pennies as well. Of course, I have to, because I got a mortgage to pay, and a car payment, and everything. You know, I feel sorry for people, but what can I do? Outside in the parking lot, Masuma lashes out at her situation. They make us work so hard, and they cheat us so much, and we're human beings. We're not treated like that. I'm not an animal, I'm a human being. Of course I'm angry, and this is really shocking me. Then her anger turns to tears. But she might take heart from other shoppers. After seeing some of what we found in Bangladesh, Vilma Matera and Peggy Rockiola say they would be willing to pay 25 or 50 cents extra for a pair of pants. And I would still have a bargain. Are we as consumers partly to blame for their plight because of the demand we've placed on retailers to keep prices low? I would say yes. I would say yes, to be truthful. We're all looking out for ourselves. Walmart declined to be interviewed on camera, but in emails to Dateline, the company says, we strongly believe that our business and the wages and benefits we provide have helped improve the lives of many thousands of workers in many parts of the world. As for the allegation by that factory owner who told us Walmart insisted on paying two pennies less instead of one penny more for his goods, Walmart says it is a totally unsubstantiated claim that should be given no credibility. And Walmart says it discusses prices with suppliers in a responsible manner that takes many factors into consideration. The company also says it considers itself an advocate of lower prices for the customer and makes no apologies for driving a hard bargain with its suppliers. A spokesman adds that Walmart inspects more factories than anyone else, more than 12,000 a year worldwide, including Masuma's factory, the Wills Group. Walmart says it inspected the factory in 2004 and identified numerous violations of standards and worked with the factory to ensure better performance. The company says ensuring proper workplace standards is an ongoing challenge and it will discontinue business with factories that will not take corrective action. Enforcing codes of conduct is the responsibility not only of retailers like Walmart, but also of companies that supply products that end up in those stores. Apparel maker Sara Lee, for instance, which owns the brand of pants Masuma makes, says it too sent inspectors into the Wills factory and says the inspectors found the plant meets appropriate standards. The Wills group itself did not respond to our request for comment. The other factory we showed, the Rising group, says it abides by all laws on working hours and conditions. Back in the U.S., Kevin Burke represents Sara Lee and hundreds of other American apparel makers. He says the inspection process has made things better, but he acknowledges it's not foolproof. In Bangladesh, the work week is supposed to be 60 hours. But when we were there, we saw factories routinely violating that. If we can find that, why is it so difficult for American companies and their representatives 
define that. The goal is to make the workplace a better place. So you don't find conditions like you described. Now, are there conditions out there? Of course there are. Um, do, we, do we like that? No, we don't. We want to see that eliminated. Burke says over the long haul, American business is good for poor countries like Bangladesh. The fact is we're creating, helping to create jobs that hopefully over time will increase their economy. Now, this doesn't happen overnight. This is a change that goes over a generation or two. But for those living in Bangladesh, a generation is a long, long time. And the struggle could get even worse. Competition from China may be forcing some factory owners in Bangladesh to lower prices even more. And that means workers' pay might not be going up anytime soon. In the meantime, since we first met Masuma, she started a new job as a labor organizer, trying to help improve the lives of factory workers in Bangladesh. And she continues to keep some hope alive for the future. We want the jobs. It's not that we don't want work in Bangladesh, but we want to be treated with respect. That's exactly right. Every employee should treat with respect. No ifs, ands, buts, or excuses. You're our manager. You're not God. You're not an animal. Treat people with respect, and you will get respect. That's the way around, and that's how you and that's how you can make sure that something like this won't ever happen again. Okay. A girl and a poodle. Sounds like a uh, sounds like a good title about a YouTube channel name but a channel named a girl and a poodle. Well, the YouTube shorts you're about the list of YouTube shorts you're about to see could even could even make you schedule as a dog lover. And she's the subject of tonight's follow break. Hi. Hi. Cat, right? Yes. I'll be honest. I saw your dog on your profile. He's so precious. Oh, yeah. He's so cute. I did notice only one picture of him. Why is that? Well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, surely he's important enough to get more than one picture on your profile. Yeah, but there's other parts of my life that are just as important. Red flag. What was that? I said I'm glad. But there are other parts of your life that are important. Like what? I'm going to school right now to become a doctor. No way! Yeah, it's pretty cool. Do you know there's ten times more doctors than there are beds? I didn't know that. Yeah, it's a shame more people don't care about animal health. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Not too late to change your major. I better get going. I've got a long drive ahead of me. Oh, where do you live? Oh, I own a penthouse downtown. Oh, so you'd rather buy a penthouse than a yard for your dog? Yeah, I don't think he minds too much. Hello, Animal Services? What's your address? Hi! Hi! Cat, right? Yes, I'll be honest. I'm she got a whole list of YouTube shorts. Six seconds or less. We're gonna try to narrow it down. Hey! Hi! Ah. Oh, I know I promised you dinner, but I wanted to include your dog too, so I've got stuff for a barbecue. Really? Yeah, I made this extra hot dog for Oliver. Wow, that's so thoughtful. Before you give it to him, would Make you sure to blow on it? Yeah, I got you. <laughs> Here you go, buddy. Thanks. When you're done eating, we should go for a ride. Where? Oh, you'll see. Just make sure to bring Oliver. What are you doing here? Oh, I thought we could get Oliver a toy. Really? Which one do you like more? I can't decide. Oh, let's just get them both. Oh, no, no, no. You don't have to do that. Oh, I wanted to. Anything to make Oliver happy. Thanks for buying those toys for Oliver. That was really sweet. Yeah, of course. Sorry I didn't get you anything. Is there anything you want? Oh, um, I don't know. That's a hard one. Uh, your last name. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, I know I promised you dinner. Hey, is this is a... Oliver, I'm hot. Is this the car? Yes, this is our most reliable Actually, model. Do you mind if I back? Uh, sure. What are you doing? Oh, just making sure it's big enough for my dog. This should be okay. <laughs> oh, these seats are fabric? Yeah, they're actually oh, brand new. that's too bad. Dog hair and fabric? Not a good mix. Windows are automatic, which is really nice. Are right, everything okay? Yeah, just making sure the windows are low enough my dog can stick his head out. How's the suspension? Uh, should be good. It needs good. to be smooth so my dog can nap on road trips. The windows are tinted for privacy. Why would I need privacy? Oh, well, it also blocks the sun for your dog. So what do you think? Oh, 
There's no vents in the back, sorry. There's no AC in the back for my dog. Oh. Have a good day. Wait, 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 I, I have one more option. It even has dog mode. Dog mode? But it's three times the price. <laughs> Oliver, I'm home. Oliver, wanna come run Here's some errands? It's a date. Hey. hey, you and Oliver ready for a date? Yes. Oh no, Oliver, that's- Oh, he should probably take front anyway, so he's close to the AC. Oh, I'll just take back then. What do you guys want? Oh, I'll have- Oh, sorry. Oliver should order first. <laughs> sorry, I guess they ran out of hamburger patties. Oh, well then what's that? Oh, he must have given Oliver the last one. Yeah, Oliver's like, yee! How is it? Good. Mind if I sit between you guys? Oh. Uh, if Oliver doesn't mind. <laughs> um, like, you know what, I'll just try me. Over here. I was like, try me. Thanks for having me over. Yeah, thanks for coming. Oh, I gotta go, buddy. Come on. Oh, I don't think she wants me to leave. Maybe he wants you to stay a little longer. Oh, I'd love to. Really? Hey, you guys might keep it down. I'm working in the morning. Oh, sorry, we were just hanging out. Okay, have fun. Hey! hey. You're coming to get food, right? Oh, I can't leave my dog alone in the car. Hey, you guys made it. Of course, you wouldn't miss it. <laughs> wow, thirsty much? Oh, no, this is... Hey! Hey, you ready to go? Yes, one second. Oh, what are you doing? Bringing all of her. Oh, my car only has two seats, so... You can't leave without them. <laughs> oh, yeah, you made it. Thanks for walking so Oliver could take shotgun. Yeah, walking. Yeah, scratch on the seat. That was there before he got Wait, here, what? Here you go. Oh, what's this? How long do I have to do this for? Oh, just as long as the sun's out. I don't want Oliver to overheat. <laughs> don't want Oliver to overheat then? Okay, hold on. How long do I have to do this for? Oh, just as long as the sun's out. I don't want Oliver to overheat. Oh, that's so nice of you. You didn't have to get me one too. Oh, the sick one's for Oliver. Sorry. Oh, so I'll get my own then. Oh, pretty sure they just closed. Thanks, we had a good time. Yeah, maybe next time we can do it without the dog. <laughs> She's like, yeah, maybe. So this is it, huh? Oh, yeah, you're gonna... Hey, so glad you could make it. Yeah, I wouldn't miss it. Hey, buddy. <laughs> hey, you made it. Come in. Your dog's not gonna run outside, is he? Oh, no, he's totally trained. Oh, no! Weird, he must have seen a squirrel or something. Come in. Want yeah, thanks. Can Oliver have some? Oh, no, I don't want him to learn to be one of those dogs that thanks. You sure he doesn't already know how? Oh, he's <laughs> just admiring you. Oh, crap, I forgot to take him on a walk today. I can help walk him. Is he leash trained? Of course. Um, I thought you said he didn't pull. Well, he just gets a little excited. <laughs> Sorry, is your hand okay? I swear he doesn't usually pull like that. You know it's okay to say he's not trained, right? No, no, he is. He always lets it. Oh, Oliver, off the couch. Oliver, your palms are muddy. Off the couch. Dogs can't. Hey. Hey. Oh, is that the dog from your profile? Oh yeah, this is. This I one's one like of my favorites. Oliver's hair a little too short too. Hey. Oh, you brought your dog. I know it's our first date. I hope you don't mind. I don't mind at all. How did I get so lucky? I'm on a date with the most beautiful blonde with brown eyes sitting right next to me. I mean, I did just get my hair done yesterday. Oh, I was talking about Oliver and Nala. Oh, yeah. Oops. Great. Oh, they're late. Sweet. <laughs> you know, it's kind of hot out here. I'm feeling a little thirsty. Oh, don't worry. I got some water. Oh, Is that shit. All you yeah, but don't worry, that should be enough for the dogs. Maybe we should just go home and watch a movie. Let's do it. I'm not cuddling, but You are? <laughs> I can really use a massage. My neck is killing me. Oh, that sucks. You should probably ice it or something. <sighs> Thanks for the date. We had a lot of fun. Hey! If you're gonna go on a date with somebody, leave your fucking dog. <laughs> but if you and your dog wanna go on a date, you need to cuddle with more, you need to cuddle less with the dog and more with the more with the woman. 
That's a lesson in dating. And that's all for this edition of Give Me a Break Monday. We will see you again for Give Me a Break Wednesday with the power of friendly persuasion. You don't just seem to have it. We're going to tell you some... We're gonna, you're going to be four contenders. You're going to take a date line experiment all about the friendly persuasion. Is it something we're born with or we don't have it? So uh, I'll let you know. Before I see you to make Give Me a Break, stop going and speak up. Concentration, not strength. No jaywalking. Especially in California. As always, don't cuddle, don't cuddle more with your dog, and less with your girlfriend, unless you have a date. <laughs> Just joking, or am I? <laughs> so I have the kid around a lot in the show. You have a good night.